What if I told you that there's a scientifically proven method to predict with 93% accuracy in just three minutes if your relationship is doomed to fail? So whether you're in a painful relationship seeking answers or single attempting to find out why your last relationship ended, today I'm gonna to reveal how this method works and better yet, what are the top four things you can do starting today to prevent this from happening to you. And I first found out that there's a human being capable of sitting down with you and your guy and after three minutes predict with 94% accuracy if you will be divorced within the next six years that blew my mind and filled me with a lot of curiosity. What I want to do right now is use the research of this finding to share with you something that's been scientifically proven and tested again and again instead of what maybe Cosmo Magazine might be saying it's missing in a relationship which by the way, great secret, it's gonna say it's sex and lots of sex what maybe your horoscope, which might have been potentially written by a human being who was living in their mom's basement, sharing with you what's possible for you in love. I wanna make sure that you can defy the odds by using something that's proven to work. The way this experiment went is Dr. Gottman, which is one of the most prolific researchers in relationships in human history, in his lab got together over 120 recently married couples. These are couples who have been married six months or less because it's the honeymoon period of a marriage, right? This is when things are supposed to be really good and really happening. He got them in the lab, they filled the questionnaire and they were sat down and asked to discuss one or two topics that were contentious between them, two things that they didn't agree on. When they sat down, they had a bunch of electrodes placed in their head, in their chest. They were measuring body temperature, they were measuring heart rate, they were measuring how much sweat was coming out of them. They were also using computer technology to be able to catalog facial expressions, tone of voice, the actual words that were used. And each person had a little knob where they could pinpoint if something was particularly painful or actually good. When they sat down, uh, they were asked to discuss this for 15 minutes. The results were cataloged into three different groups. Group number one is couples who after six years were happily married. Group number two, couples who after six years were unhappily married. This is the kind of relationship where you tolerate each other but you wish you were in a different relationship and you don't leave because you're in too much fear of leaving the person so you're suffering in silence basically. And the last group is groups of people who were divorced after six years or before six years. I want to share with you what the number one predictor of divorce was. They were measuring under conflict how many positive interactions versus negative interactions took place. And to give you something less fluffy than that, positive interactions with things such as interest, if you were paying attention to what your partner is saying versus ignoring them, if you're validating them, if you were providing any form of affection during the discussion, if you were using humor to diffuse the high energy or joy at any point, those things were cataloged as positive effects. Then negative effects would be if you're being angry or if you're being defensive or if you're whining or if you're playing fear or contempt uh, or stonewalling. Now, if you were doing any one of those things, then they were marked as well. So here's the findings. Finding number one, couples who were happily married displayed a ratio of five positive versus one negative affirmation in this discussion. So think about it this way. They were arguing, but they were still finding ways to find common ground, to validate each other, to show that they're interested, to not deflect, to not push the blame onto somebody else. Couples who were divorced displayed a ratio of one to one or lower than one. And in the middle were the couples that were kind of like miserably still together. So think about this. When you argue with your partner, when you argue with your partner in the past, how many positive versus negative things take place when you discuss something that's challenging? Not when things are good, but when things are challenging. Number two is that they were able to determine how the conversation was going to go from the first three minutes of the conversation. So much so that even though they were talking for 15 minutes, they could cut down to the first three minutes and within three minutes, based on how it started, determine how the relationship was going to go. Why? And this is the third point, because patterns run our life. The thing that blows my mind from this experiment is that the experiment was predicting basically if things don't change in these interactions, this is what will happen at the end of six years. And the challenging piece is that it could have changed, but it didn't. Why didn't it change? Because it's extremely hard 
for you to change a pattern that you don't understand. In other words, it's hard to fix something you don't think is broken. If you're running your car and there's something going on with the traction and you, instead of recognizing that you have no tread on the tires, you feel that it's the pebbles in the road, then you're gonna continue blaming the pebbles in the road. Most human beings fail to recognize the spectrum of love and they reduce love to a feeling. Well, it's somewhat true that love is a feeling. It's so much more than that. Equating love to a feeling would be the same thing as saying Albert Einstein is some German dude who once worked at a patent office. Yeah, that was true in his life, but he was also a prolific researcher and scientist who discovered what are the most important laws of physics today. Love is also an active verb. Love is a daily, sometimes minute by minute commitment. Love is a skill. When you understand that love is all those things, then you also understand that you can change things. You also understand that the way things are don't have to continue if you recognize your patterns and if you apply different methodologies to dealing with anger, dealing with challenges, and also to repair interactions. Before I share the top four things you can do starting today to prevent your relationship from ending in doom, if you're a single woman listening to me right now, I want to invite you to get the answer to the question, what's the number one reason you're still single? What I've done is I've taken many years of helping women find love in different continents, different walks of life, different age groups, and different love challenges. And I put them together in a quiz you can take in about 60 seconds that will answer that question for you. So all you have to do if you want to find out your specific answer is go to the first link in the description of this video. You will see a page that looks like this. Answer a few simple questions and in the next 60 seconds you'll have an answer to the question what's the number of reason you're still single and a custom report that based on your specific blind spot will share with you what's the next best step you can take today to attract the guy you want and enter a fulfilling relationship. I shared with you that the researchers were tracking negative specific interactions in conflict with the couples. The four most corrosive ones that they've identified are number one, criticism, which is the expressing challenges in the relationship or in your partner as though your partner is flawed while secretly hoping to be rewarded for your insights. Now, you could say, I can't believe you did this again, or I'm disappointed in you, right? That's one way of doing it. Or you can use a different technique, which is there's gonna be four little steps. Step number one is saying what your feelings are. My, I'm feeling disappointed, I'm feeling scared, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling, feeling the blank. Then because of this situation, the house wasn't cleaned on time. And when the guests arrived, I, it was not good. <laughs> Instead of you're such a slob, why don't you clean the house when you said you would, right? So explain your feelings, explain the situation, and then go to the need. It would really help me if next time you can fulfill your promise and do this, or if it can really help me by you now helping me to do a cleanup right now before next guests arrive, whatever it is that you need. Instead of venting and pointing out the challenge and flossing your partner, saying what you feel and what the situation is without the drama, and then expressing your needs, and then in any way you can appreciate the person for either listening to you or for being willing to, to do it better next time, the more you do that, the more you're going from criticism to solution. The next one is defensiveness. And defensiveness takes place when you start critically with someone, then the next best thing the person's gonna do is gonna say, ah, it's not me, it's you, or you're just hurting my feelings, or something along the lines of, I, it's not my responsibility, you deal with it yourself. That is very corrosive in a relationship. So what you can do in an argument, first and foremost, if you recognize that the person is connecting with you in a way that's critical, then set a kind boundary saying, hey, can you please state this again in a different way? Or when you say it that way, it's really harsh and I really don't feel good about it. Can you say it differently? When you set a clean boundary with that and take some responsibility, not the whole responsibility if you don't think it's yours, but you can take even 5% responsibility of what's taking place, then that goes a long way into your partner knowing that you're open for feedback instead of deflecting the blame and putting the blame on them. The third one, is contempt. Contempt was of the four corrosive stances, the most corrosive of them all. Contempt would be something where you talk to your partner with an air of superiority. You talk down on your partner. You basically say, I'm better than you in this way. I'm more spiritual, I'm more intelligent, I'm more organized, 
and you're kind of lecturing your partner from a pedestal saying, I've reached this point, but you please need to reach this point with me instead of being there with him, figuring out what needs to happen. So what are the things that can prevent contempt from ruining your relationship and ruining your arguments is number one, express your needs from the I. You're not stupid, you're not less than me, is I need this, I want this, it would help me if. The second part to that is beyond the conflicts, you need to build a culture of appreciation. You need to build, you need to make deposits in your partner's emotional bank account so when push comes to shove and something challenging is taking place, you have something to draw out from. You have something to really keep yourself grounded and not just go to the first knee reaction which might be punching someone metaphorically or fleeing the situation. And the last one is stonewalling. Stonewalling is when you feel flooded with emotions, negative emotions because of what's taking place and instead of taking some responsibility or taking some time out from the interaction, you don't pay attention to your partner, you close your eyes, you just look into the wall and you're trying to self-soothe in a way that's making your partner feel more upset because they know you're not listening, they know you can't be there. So here's a solution for stonewalling. When you start noticing that your heart rate is going up, when you know that you can't handle the situation for whatever reason, take some time out from a personal responsibility stance. Instead of saying, you're bothering me too much, I need to disconnect from you. It's like, no, I'm feeling flooded with emotions right now. My best self is not present, so I need to take, specify the time period, 20 minutes. I mean, start with that. Self-soothe, breathe, meditate, write, journal, whatever you need to do, jump up and down, take a cold shower, and come back to you when I'm a better version of myself. Your partner can do the same or not, but you will be in a much better position to set stronger boundaries, to understand what's happening, to assume part of your responsibility, or to say, you know what, we need to take even more time to finalize this discussion because it's still not working. When you take the time to understand that there's four things in those arguments that are the responsible elements of ending a relationship, you become really curious and really hungry to figure out when I'm arguing with my partner, how can I make that ratio five to one? Five positives for one negative. And as I said before, it can be with your facial expression, it can be with your level of interest, it can be with your questions, it can be with you setting strong and healthy boundaries. When you can do that, your relationship can last. Hope this is helpful and useful. If you like this video, please click like, thumbs up, write in a comment below what's the biggest takeaway you're taking from this. And as always, I challenge you to live a full and a conscious life. <music>